good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. But again, like I usually say, for those of us who are not sure of where we are, I will stick to say welcome. I know that some of us are in Lima, others are in Uganda, others are in Cote d'Ivoire. So I will say welcome uh, to this uh, webinar. My name is Alice Kayongo, and I have the honor of uh, welcoming you all to this very important DEC study club session that is entitled Speed Up, Scale Up, TB Testing, National Diagnostic Networks, which tests go where? And this webinar is basically organized by the Diagnostic Security Consortium and the Global TB Community Advisory Board. It's being organized in three parts, mainly to explore the evolving TB diagnostic, uh, diagnostic landscape and strategies to increase TB testing coverage. But specifically for this, um, uh, for this webinar today, we will be focusing much more on the National Diagnostics Network networks, as well as um, uh, you know, what tests, which tests go where. I know for sure that many of you have been attending several sessions, and like I say, this one will definitely be worth your while because we are changing lives. And for those of you who are with us on uh, 17th of September, welcome back. Some of you are joining us for the first time. Welcome to, we are ready to move our bus. We want to go, we want to continue. And just to remind you that we have this session, these uh, series are organized in three parts. This is the second of the third that is basically focusing on um, the national diagnostics uh, networks, uh, which tests go where. I need to let you know that this session is um, one of, uh, uh, you know, it's it's one of our efforts, our ongoing efforts um, in leading to the discussions that will be held at the ASLM Global Fund meeting in Abidjan next, uh, next month, early next month, where we are actually aiming to empower civil society members and TB advocates to better understand the role of diagnostics in improving uh, TB outcomes. And um, uh, to help us go through or uh, understand what we are talking about today, we have assembled a brilliant a panel, uh, a panel of uh, experts. Uh, with us, we have three experts. We have Michael Campbell, who's the Senior Director, Tuberculosis with the Clinton Health Access Initiative. We have Paolo Migere, who's uh, the Director, Laboratory Services Team, again with the Clinton Health Access Initiative. Uh, and we have Talemwa Nalugwa, who's the Program Manager, Uganda Tuberculosis Implementation Research Consortium, Walimo. And as always, I say that I will be your moderator, yours truly. You have no choice but to hang around me for the next uh, couple of minutes. And I promise you that you will enjoy the time that you will spend with me, that you will spend with us as we unearth what we have for you today. We have a lot in store, not only today, but the conversation will definitely continue sometime to come. But first, let's focus on what we have today. And I want to encourage us all that um, we do have a Q&A chat. Please, when you have time, when you have had that very pressing thing that you want more clarity on, please place it in the Q&A chat. You will get a response instantly. In DEC and TB Club, things are done instantly. In fact, advocacy will be done instantly. Don't take me for my word. We will. You may need to um uh, to confirm some of what I am saying, and I will, you know, I you can hold me for sure to what I am saying. That said, though, um, having welcomed you, I want to let you know about uh, uh DEC. I know many of you have heard me talking about DEC, the Diagnostic Equity Consortium, and for those of you who have received uh, the, the the flyer that was talking that was um, basically promoting this webinar, you saw a DEC, you know, and you saw TB Cub. So. Here is what we have for you today, just to let you know who we are and what we do. The Di Diagnostics Equity Consortium is um, one of the organizing forces behind this webinar. And um, I want to let you know that uh, you, you can think of DEC as the superheroes of the diagnostics world. I have always said that look at us as superheroes, but put the caps away and stay with the power that we have to make things change, to create change. Um, 
Uh, and I also need to say that diagnostics for sure, like like uh, 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 um, are more like the unsung heroes of healthcare. You go to a place, you just never realize that uh, you need them until they are not there. That's when you know that, oops, I actually did need uh, a diagnostic, you know, uh, to, to do A, B, and C. But the problem is that there is very limited to no access to these diagnostics, especially in low resource settings and most especially in low and middle income countries. It is so much so that only 19% of people in these regions can access diagnostics that they need. And that is why. Uh, you know, the Diagnostics Equity Consortium was formed to try and change this trend. There must be access uh, at all the time, everywhere, and whenever it is needed. So recognizing these challenges, for sure, the World Health Organization adopted the resolution to strengthen diagnostics capacity worldwide, and DEC was formed in alignment with this call to action. Our mission is very, 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 very simple and straightforward. We bring together civil society, affected communities, and experts to advocate for better diagnostics access, particularly in low and middle income countries where healthcare systems are most in need and support. And in DEC or at DEC, we seek to reshape the diagnostics policies. We seek to improve healthcare practices, to monitor progress through advocacy, through research, and most importantly, through community-driven initiatives. The Diagnostics Equity Consortium, or DEC, and our slogan is that we usually say all hands on deck because we want to change lives. I want to say that we do have four main work streams. The first work stream is the DEC Study Club which is the work stream that has actually gathered us today. And in this work stream, um, uh, it is organized in such a way that it is it is a platform that we use to increase diagnostics literacy, to foster collaboration, and to strategize for collective advocacy efforts. They, they, uh, this uh, a particular work stream helps participants develop a deeper understanding of diagnostics and imaging equity, empowering them to advocate for greater access to life-saving tools. The second uh, um, uh, work stream is what we refer to as the speed up, scale up, or you can refer to it as SUSU because it is speed up, scale up, uh, and it is up to you to call it SUSU in whatever way you can say SUSU or SUSU, but it's simply a short for speed up, scale up. It's an initiative that is focused on timely engagement and strategic scaling up of new diagnostics. Um, the third work stream is uh, the Diagnostics Policy Lab, which is an accountability platform that is aimed at tracking, measuring, and improving national policies around diagnostics. The last work stream that we have is the National Accountability Framework, which is um, here we basically do uh, government engagement. Um, uh, it's focused mainly on government engagement, and uh, we make sure that uh, uh, you know the national strategies are do are, are are as ambitious as possible, and that they do um, that they do contain goals that uh, include distribution and utilization of diagnostics across all health priorities. But as we do all this under deck, I must say that we are supported by a diverse group of um, uh, experts who do uh, provide um, advisory support. And uh, these, these are usually uh, leading diagnostics equity, uh, leading diagnostics tech with technical experts. Oh, my dear, my tongue is, is uh, it, it's trying to, to betray me this morning. But um, uh, we do have clinicians as well. We do have global health professionals and DEC continues to shape the future of diagnostics access globally with the help, with the support and with the direction of this advisory group. I must say that the consortium is ho hosted by two organizations. That is the Pan-Africa Treatment Access Movement in Zimbabwe, as well as the Center for Global Health Policy and Politics at Georgetown University's O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law. And that is the organization that I do represent. So um, having said all this, uh, I want to let you know and to uh, uh, conclude by, by saying that in DEC, 
We are passionate, we are powerful, and we push for change. We say all hands on deck. I want to stop here for now, and um, I will uh, uh, request my colleague Annie, who will talk to us about the TB uh, Community Advisory Board, which is the other organization with which um, uh, the O'Neill Institute is organizing this uh, webinar. Thank you so much, and welcome, Annie. Thank you so much, Alice, for the floor. Yeah, uh, my name is Annie Hernasari, and I am the vice chair of Global TB Cap. Uh, I want to a little bit introduce about what is the TB Cap. So in 2011, the treatment action group, along with other stakeholders in the TB product, development and access identify the need of the TB research community. So we want to benefit from strong research, literate community activists so that uh, we want as a result that the global TB community advisory board was, uh, that is the first time created. So the TB cap act in advisory capacity to product developer and institution conducting clinical trial of the new TB drugs and sorry, my English is not good. Uh, and also the diagnostic and vaccine and provide input on study design, early access and regulatory approval, post-marketing and implementation strategic. So the TB cap is dedicated to increasing community involvement in TB research and to mobilizing political will regarding the key TB product development and also the access issue. So who is the TB CAP membership? Uh, we are from people living with HIV and people with live experience with TB or caregiver or people with TB and also from community that use drug or drug user network. And also we have anthropologists, clinician, psychologists, and intellectual property expert are a liar, a chemist, a science journalist, and we also have leader of community civil society, people that work with national and other side of the cap. And also we have member of the WHO civil society tax force, and also the Global Fund Country Coordinating Mechanism. And we have also the member of UNITAID, Stop TB Partnership, and other board delegation. And the current geographical coverage is uh, for the Emeritus member is from Brazil, Cote d'Ivoire, India, Indonesia, Kenya, Mexico, Moldova, Peru, Russia, South Africa, Ukraine, United States, and also the Jim Zimbabwe. So yeah, the TP gap uh, closely follow research and what's coming out of the pipeline and lead advocacy for access to innovation. And that we have been building our member capacity and knowledge on TB diagnostic to given how active the pipeline is and so that the, the TBCAP member will be able to contribute to discussion or, or, or maybe to make decision at the global or national level regarding introduction of the new TBCAP, new TB diagnostic. So that's why the TBCAP is closely for uh, work to purpose of this the DEC study club. So that is, uh, short introduction. I will give it the floor to Alice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Annie. And I know that by now we can all ably say a word or two about the deck and about TB Cub. Um, uh, and, and Annie, once again, is the co-chair of the TB Cub. Uh, coming on next, I want to call uh, Sharon Ann, who will give us a summary of uh, TB Plus opportunity. Sharon Ann will be with us uh, for just a few minutes, but we want to maximize the time that we have with her today. Thank you. Over to you, Thank Sharon. you, Alice. And thank you, everyone, for joining and for our panelists. 
I'm sorry if you, some of you joined on the last session. This is, as Alice mentioned, the second of three sessions uh, because you're going to hear some things again from me. But it is so important to get it right this time, given that we have the opportunity that, as always, new tools and strategies afford. Now, you know everyone gets excited about a cool, new, crazy, sexy new tool, right? Maybe not everyone, but it's an opportunity. But it's an opportunity that has to be handled with care and with lessons from previous introductions of new tools. So I'm going to list off six problems and maybe opportunities as well of where we've gotten it wrong before and where both global health actors, civil society, activists, hopefully industry, and as, uh, as well, national governments can get it right this time around. So of course we want diagnostics that are effective, suitable, affordable, and available on a timely basis. The problems that we've had in the past is that sometimes there is a, a, a top-down nature in terms of donors selecting the tool they want to support, the tool they think is important for settings. This time around, I'm confident, and it starts with this consultation with the Africa Society of Laboratory Men uh, Medicine, as Alice mentioned, and the Global Fund, bringing together the national lab directors and the national TB program managers for a consultation to start paving the way and talking about considerations for these new tests that are emerging or have emerged from the pipeline. The second problem is disease silos. Now it is the nature of R&D for TB and TB diagnostics that it is the, the donors that largely decide what are the needs and the industry follows that direction. And this is why groups like TB Cab, Chai, Find that you heard from on the last uh, webinar are so important because we can insist early on that not only are the diagnostics suitable for TB and affordable and effective, but that we try to maximize the benefits for other diseases, both in terms of how the diagnostics are developed and where they are considered for placement, which is the point of today's webinar. Thirdly, global health actors uh, negotiate with industry for prices, for service and maintenance contracts, and for warranty extensions. We have all seen machines gone dusty, gathering dust because they are inoperable or because the, there's a lack of supply or a break in the supply chain for the needed reagents. We obviously need to do better this time around, and that's going to take quite a bit. And part of it is the affordability of reagents, is the service and maintenance, and making sure that that maintenance is honored. And it's also the warranty, that uh, extension of the warranty that often falls to national governments to cover. We need to have greater awareness among civil society, and obviously DEC hopes to help with that. But it also starts with ambition, right? That's always the critical missing piece. We need to get government to think that they can do more, have more coverage and have it sooner. So one way to talk about ambition is in terms of facility coverage. What percentage of primary healthcare facilities and other public health sector facilities have what they need in order to provide a timely TB diagnosis, and even below that in terms of the community level. Finally, advocacy. We need a faster pace of scale up. It has been how many years since Gene Expert has been around, and we still have many facilities that do not have the proper sample collection or the ability to administer or run the tests. And then finally, this other missing piece 
that goes along with ambition, which is at the tail end, is accountability. What can we build into the new funding agreements that might come from Global Fund or Unidate or PEPFAR or USAID? What can we make of the new national strategic plans for TB or some of the uh, uh, diagnostic network optimization operational strategies that you're gonna hear about from CHAI in terms of giving civil society the information we need to hold government to account, to hold industry to account, to hold global health actors to account, to hold ourselves to account. So if, if information is the oxygen for accountability, we need to build it in. Sorry for talking so long and thank you so much again. Over, to, back to you, Alice. Thank you so much, Sharon Ann. And having said that if information is the oxygen for everything, then we need to hold on to it. Uh, it reminds me of, uh, you know, what I usually say about diagnostics being like Wi-Fi. You never notice that uh, they are not working. You know, when you, you imagine that time you're looking at your phone and looking out for Wi-Fi, but then you realize that you have a signal but it's actually not working. That is where that is exactly what we are talking about now. Um, that said, I want to remind us all that um, uh, we do have French interpretation, simultaneous French French interpretation. Please, uh, if you prefer to participate in French, uh, please go to uh, the pen down on your screen and be able to um, get to the French channel. Otherwise, um, uh, I will proceed to my next uh, presenter, who is none other than um, Michael, Michael Campbell. And um, Michael is, uh, oh dear, I know that Michael is the senior director of uh, tuberculosis. Sorry, Michael is the senior director of tuberculosis at the Clinton Health Access Initiative based in Boston, um, and he has 17 years of experience in designing, managing, and delivering complex projects. I told you, we bring you all the experts. We have the experts here. Just stay calm. You're going to get all the information that you require. Um, you can't get everything really in one and a half hours, but at least we are starting the conversation. We are actually continuing from the conversation that we started on September 19th. We are continuing today and we will continue even hereafter. So Michael is going to talk to us about the TB landscape. Michael, over to you. Uh, thank you. If we could go on to the next page, that would be great. Um, uh, it's a very hard act to follow Alice. She is like such a, a dynamo. And it's been uh, really, firstly, thank you to um, the sponsors, the DEC, TB Cab, and the O'Neill Institute for the opportunity to chat today. Let me perhaps start with um, some context of what Chai does in this space and the angle that we bring to this, which I think is complementary to some of the slides that you will have seen last week from FIND. Um, Chai has been involved in the analysis of some of these tools from a usability and user acceptance level in several countries on behalf of both donors and suppliers. Chai is currently working on diagnostic network assessments to understand where equipment is based and optimization, the next phase of trying to make that an enhanced solution. Chai is also working with support from UnitAid, uh, the Gates Foundation, FCDO, um, and uh, others to, um, to bring all this together to try to address some of the access pricing and the terms of making sure that equipment is available through not just a price for procurement, but a total cost of ownership solution where we're making sure that equipment is maintained and operational and functional. Let's speak a little bit about the opportunity in TB diagnostics. And it starts with the case finding challenge of tuberculosis. There are sort of three big goals that were identified in the last presentation. One is there's a set of tools that are required to improve TB case detection for people that we are currently missing. The three that are visualized here as exemplars are oral swab, 
um, a urine sample indicative of a TV lamb, but also the idea that we move away from sputum, which is difficult to produce if you're a person living with HIV, or you may have posibacillary TB. Based on more recent um, surveys that have been done in a number of our countries, we are increasingly learning that up to 50% of active TB is not symptomatic. And the idea that we wait for people to present and produce sputum may be a constraint to the detection process. And on the third hand, it is how do we improve access to molecular testing closer to where patients are? I would like to highlight that a lot of the work to date has been done on proving the performance of these tools. What is the sensitivity, the specificity, the limits of detection, very technical tools that help you to understand, does the product do what it says on the label? Is it a safe and appropriate diagnostic to be giving to individuals? I would also, through this discussion, encourage you to ask how are they being used and where and why are they being used? Oral swab has the potential to be a great alternative to sputum as a sample type if you're in a PHC. I would also ask the question, if I can do an oral swab, which is safer, for the patient, safer for the healthcare worker, does that need to be done in a facility? Does that begin to open new service delivery channels that are more patient friendly and affordable? For example, I could swab you um, in a active community setting. I could swab patients if I'm doing contact tracing, which begins to push the boundaries of the facility and the home in terms of where TB diagnostics could be delivered. In an ideal world, from my perspective, I would like to see HIV self-testing, CB swabbing being done in the household as a way of bringing services to where patients are, rather than asking patients to head to where the diagnostics are based. If we look at the second piece, it is around affordable uh, and fast screening tools. This is it's a body of work designed to help address the challenge of people may not have a cough, but they may already have damage to their lungs, which even after treatment continues as post-TB sequelae. So this solution is not just about how do I treat the TB disease, it's about how do we treat the patient? How do we make sure that we're addressing challenges before they happen and we're finding diagnostic solutions? So X-ray is a, is a great tool for helping to assist with diagnosis. CAD is helping to improve equity of access where we don't have to wait for radiographic support. We can use digital tools to amplify the impact of radiologists in very interesting and compelling ways. And the third bucket is really around how are we replacing suboptimal tools? Like we use a lot of sputum, sputum smear microscopy, not because it's a great tool, but because Countries have the infrastructure and it's relatively cheap. Smutum smear microscopy in most countries is less than two or three dollars, as opposed to a gene expert, which is seven dollars and ninety-nine cents for the cartridge. But on a total cost to, to country basis, that could be more like ten dollars as opposed to two or three dollars. So it does raise an access question around affordability. And so there are a variety of new tools um, designed to do everything from um, instrument free point of care tests to be able to diagnose you, diagnose you in communities without an instrument, true point of care. If you look to the left side of these three at the bottom of the screen under number three, which is something that a community health worker could take with them into a community, and then trying to improve the throughput and the cost of molecular tests in high scale to be cost effective as opposed to sputum smear microscopy. So there's solutions at the end where it's closer to the patient. So it's very portable and low throughput and solutions that are really embedded in lab systems that are meant to be higher throughput, but lower cost than existing platforms. May I please ask you to turn the page for me? Let's go on to what I was describing in terms of the, um, the, 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 the molecular testing space and the exciting new dimensions and, and work that's happening here. In, uh, there are three kind of buckets of our strategy for moving testing closer to patients, both in hospitals and laboratories, but in an ideal scenario where we're increasingly able to push that towards primary care or at-home solutions. Near point of care 
is sort of analogous to the expert systems that we're similar to with. They're benchtop solutions, they require power, they're often facility-based, and the access challenge becomes often the affordability. How many of these devices can I place in a country? What is the cost to be able to do a test on that platform? The true point of care platforms that are emerging become you know, a little bit decoupled from a facility. They're portable, they're battery operated, and the question is not, do they work well? Because we're doing all the scientific work to see that. The question is, how can they be deployed alongside this network to expand access and to enhance patient experience um, and the network's responsiveness to what patients require? And the third space is really around this instrument-free work, which is pushing towards, okay, I get rid of a device. It's a pure consumable. It's kind of like the RDTs that we use in malaria, if we could have something that were that simple, we really can move away from facilities and bring testing almost anywhere in our countries. If I may ask you to move to the third page, please. With these tools, and again, come some trade-offs and a requirement to think a little bit differently about how uh, these tools can work. There is a question of, as Sharon Ann asked, is this just for TB? Could this meet other testing requirements? Viral load for HIV, uh, hepatitis. Are there other things that are important to my country or patients that the device can deliver on? And not just can the device deliver on it, but does the manufacturer have the incentive to make the products that are required to do that testing? Um, what is the cost point? Um, where do I place it in the network? A piece of what we're going to talk about today. It is very easy in the diagnostic space to fixate on sensitivity and specificity. That's been the language that most people in the diagnostic space have been trained with. Better sensitivity is better. So gene expert detects, let's for simplification say 90% of patients and some of these new solutions may only detect 82% of patients. So does that make gene expert a better solution for the government? Let me walk you through a little bit of a thought exercise to highlight how you might position that differently. And it's really around the concept that's both diagnostic coverage, so how many people are covered by this approach, and ultimately diagnostic yield. Up to 30% of people can't produce a sputum. They might be children, they might be a person living with HIV, they may just not have active TB with symptoms, such that sputum production is part of their process. So I have a tool that will get 90% of the positive patients, but I can only test 70% of the people. That, in terms of the diagnostic yield, 70% of the people times 90% working is 63% of people get tested. That's not great <laughs> if we're trying to find all the TB and take care of all patients. If I think of an alternative that says, I'm able to do a, a sample that's a swab, everyone can produce a swab. That's 100% diagnostic coverage. If I have a test that only finds 82% of people, I find 82% of the TB that was there instead of 63% with a sputum um, molecular test alternative. So it is important to think about the specific performance of the tool, but to think more broadly about some of the program and human objectives of what these tools are meant to be able to deliver. So in summary, I did want to recap that we are in a stage where we have a variety of new tools that are being explored through great diagnostic consortia that are coordinated, that are looking to build the evidence for the WHO to be able to speak to platforms. In terms of the gaps, it is some of these questions around what is a use case that is appropriate for my country, appropriate for patients, and appropriate for health workers and the diagnostic system to make sure that we're getting the full value out of these tools. As Sharon Ann said, we are currently in the largest process of capitalization since the rollout of Gene Expert. The Global Fund is going to fund between two and 3,000 X-ray devices to be procured in this round alone. The cost of that is in the hundreds of millions. Um, we are talking about a, you know, they, the Global Fund has set up a market shaping tool to help countries with transition to some of these platforms in the tune of about $100 million. So we have a moment of time where there's a lot of resource, there's a lot of focus on new tools, and there's a fantastic opportunity for patients, their advocates, and for communities to speak to not just there's some great tools, but there's some really 
fantastically patient-friendly delivery opportunities that these tools make possible. So I would ask not only that you think about how exciting are the tools, but how might those tools be used in ways that better meet the needs of communities and the people who are living with tuberculosis. So at that point, I'm going to stop. And um, if there are questions, I think, please, I would advise to, um, to uh, add them to the chat, I think, or the Q&A, which will be done at the end. But thank you very much for the opportunity to refresh some of the considerations about the exciting work that's being done and the opportunities for communities and patients to ensure that that is better meeting their requirements. Over. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, uh, you, you, I really couldn't agree enough with um, a lot of what you have said, actually with everything yet that you have said. I mean, just even speaking about the fact that uh, there is need for appropriate diagnostics that are not only appropriate for my country, but also for my patients and as well as for health workers and that all these diagnostics need to be brought closer to people who actually need them. So I do thank you for that. And uh, just as a reminder, uh, colleagues, if you have any question, please um, uh, direct it to uh, just place it in the Q&A chat and we will be able to uh, respond to that question. But maybe before we proceed, does anyone have a burning issue for clarification, uh, especially based on Michael's presentation? Please feel free to unmute and speak. I, unfortunately, I cannot see my chat. <laughs> if anyone wants to speak. All right. Seems okay. I see uh, Banegura. Please um, unmute. And I'll take two questions and then we'll proceed to the next uh, presentation. Uh, and, uh, Thank you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. That was a great presentation. Um, the way I see it, you seem to allude to the fact that um, oral swabs are already either in the low, in the low resource settings, or they're on the way. So the question is: Are there tests that have been done to confirm their performance characteristics, say in African settings where we have high T? Um, you said they were good for primary care settings and for community. So do we have studies that confirm their functionality? their functionality in those settings. Thank you. I will highlight that there is work that's been done in more than 800 patients across 13 countries through the R2D2 and FEND networks that were referenced in the last week's uh, report. What we have found is that um, one, we have increasingly strong evidence that oral swab is a viable approach. Um, there is There has been variability until some of the alignment with regards to the sample handling and the preparation phase, which, which makes add some variability to the results that you're seeing. Um, what we are finding, at least, or at least the emerging results seem to suggest that um, there is some slight decrease in sensitivity. Um, gene expert tends to be 90 to 93, depending on if it's expert MTB RIF or if it's expert ultra. Um, whereas we're seeing the performance of swab somewhere in the mid 80s, but we've seen evidence of it being in the 90s, depending on the process that's being delivered. I should highlight that many of the new products in development are swab native. Um, we tend to think of expert as a platform and then multiple sort of sample types, stool, other things that we've uh, pushed to sort of increase access to will just work on that platform. It was not designed that way. The cartridge is designed to do sample processing for a sputum sample and oral swab samples have a less complex matrix. Stool is much more complex. So the good news is we are somewhat delayed in getting WHO guidance around how do you swab and what's possible. I'm hopeful that that's coming next year, um, but there is a great body of evidence beginning to be built around the technical performance and swab has to be considered with the platform that it's being used with. I, I'm sorry if that's a, a sort of answer that's not entirely satisfactory answer, but um, there is good research information. And if we can do some follow-up after this, I'm happy to point to, her, to both the publications um, and the research networks that can help to aid sort of advocacy efforts. But the thought that I would encourage to everyone is, 
there's a large focus because that's the way the world works on technical performance. While we're finalizing the last bits of the technical performance recommendations to the WHO, I think it's increasingly important for advocates and for patients themselves to push the boundaries of how are we going to use these tools to make lives better for patients. And I think the devices are there. I think the evidence is increasingly there, but the evidence behind the use cases is a space that I would encourage this group to ask both their countries and the donors to say, this is great, you have a new tool. My country can't really buy it until they have a clear vision of what they're going to do and how that's going to benefit the patients, the doctors and communities. Over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. And I see that Ronald and Elaine have your hands up. Please, uh, let's proceed with the presentations. We will. I will give you first chance when we open up for uh, discussions. Um, for now, I want to turn over again to Michael and Paolo, who are going to talk to us about uh, placement strategies across several countries, DNO-linked implementation strategies across countries, uh, DNO-linked implementation strategies. So, um, uh, uh, you know, Michael has uh, really uh, has spoken to us about um, you know, the, the TB landscape, but uh, Paolo will be joining him for the next uh, session. And Paolo Migeri, uh, as mentioned earlier, is a director of a global diagnostics te team, the director of, in the global di diagnostics team at the Clinton Health Access Initiative. And um, he has over 16 years of experience in business consulting and public health. Again, I will let you know that we do have all the experts here, representatives of the experts. I will say high level experts here. So um, let's brace ourselves for all that uh, the DEC and the TB Cup do have for us. So I'll hand over to you, Michael and Paolo, once again. Uh, thank you very much. I will, um, if if I could ask you to turn the first page, I'll go fairly quickly through or to, to the second page, please, um, or the next one. I, I will talk a little bit about sort of TB progress and why the tools that we're doing, but also the need to think about this at a country by country level. Um, we've talked about, you know, TB is making progress and it's been set back by um, the challenges of the pandemic, which is absolutely true. I would draw your attention to the line that's somewhat in green with the sort of uh, error bars that represents the total number of TB cases globally. Um, and that's a framework that is somewhat disappointing. Um, if we look at the sort of TB incidents pretty much from 2000 to today, we have been in a fairly tight range between 10 and 12 uh, million people per annum. And as you see, that line doesn't really look to be making great improvement. So if I'm a TB patient, the, the, the nuance that, you know, we're making good progress, we're doing other pieces, we still have 10 million people every year that are struggling with this disease. We as a, but not just community, but everyone involved in delivering TB solutions, we have to do a better job of not just addressing TB, but addressing it early enough so that we're not leaving people cured of TB, but debilitated with lung damage and other considerations. The second side, in terms of the uh, estimated prevalence of bacterially confirmed pulmonary TB, is to really highlight that there's a absolutely enormous range of epidemiological difference. And I happen to have chosen Asia because it's a fairly big graph, um, but it is to highlight that Every country has a different epidemiological place in terms of where it is on the equation. China, which is one of the top three in the world, has a prevalence that is much lower than some countries that have lower numbers. So it speaks to every country is needing to raise its game in terms of finding more TB cases, finding them earlier, and making sure that we are genuinely making a dent in these numbers, um, not just because they're global goals, but because every single one of these numbers represents an individual, a life that is impacted, a community and a family that is damaged by the TB epidemic. May I please ask you to go to the next slide? As we described, I talked a lot about the, the strategies. Um, I did want to just, again, highlight across the next three years, there are 
quite literally more than a dozen new platforms, new technologies that governments and countries will have to navigate through to make informed decisions about how to design the way it's delivering care and how to structure its network to organize this. As we described, there's everything from very small devices that are suitable to, to go out into the community with the community health worker to very high throughput analyzers. There are multiple layers of decisions that need to be made about equipment. And I would advise all of us to start not with which equipment should I choose, but how is this going to make a dent in the TB process? How is this going to better address the testing needs of the community? How is this going to solve our problem of finding TB, uh, finding it earlier and making sure that we're using the best tool available to us and that it's affordable and manageable? I will um, just, again, highlight at the bottom of this, I point to this is going to be one of the biggest procurements in the, the context of TB. And if we get this right, it could be an incredible boost to our efforts to NTB. If we get it wrong, it will sink a spectacular amount of money with very little impact. And so I do think we all have a responsibility for thinking not just around, is this device better than that device, but really what's the value proposition to patients and the work that we're going to achieve? Um, if I may ask you to advance, please. I come on to uh, just a slide, a little bit about door-to-door -door delivery and the use cases. And I wanna talk about the implications for diagnostic network optimization. If you think about my different modalities for testing, I can do facility-based testing, which is kind of the core of what I do. It's the arrow at the bottom. It's PHC-based testing. I can do community camps for active case finding. There's a lot of paradigms of what that looks for. And increasingly, as we described, we would love to see more efforts that look almost community driven, like community health workers in facilities, be it contact tracing, be it other solutions. How do we move that closer to the patients? These are all going to hopefully, I'm hopeful, drive the demand on the networks that we are delivering. In some cases, the tools like commodities or consumables, they will be a self-contained solution. So I create a spike of demand, but I also have consumables that take up that spike of demand. But it is important to think about how will my diagnostic network have to deal with the number of patients that are being diagnosed? I would also, to this group, encourage that you think not just about how is the diagnostic network going to take the bigger load, but how do we make sure that our health system is prepared with linkage to care and all the other things that happen? I don't just want to diagnose patients. I want to diagnose, treat, and cure them. But I do want to highlight that the different modalities that we're encouraging with these tools create different demands on the network. If I have community health workers, what are the supply chain to get the products to where they need to be or to remote parts of your country? If I'm going to do more camps, Camps can do a couple of hundred people a day. Do I have the throughput to be able to give those answers in a timely manner so that I don't lose track of where that patient was? If I'm doing it at a PHC, again, that's still very standard, but how do we improve the turnaround time so that we're retaining more people in care and reducing the loss to follow-up? So each of these different modalities creates different demand for what a network in its whole picture needs to be able to deliver. May I please ask you to forward? Um, can I please turn this over to my colleague, Paolo, who can speak a little bit about DNO design and um, our work in that space? Yeah, thanks, Michael, and thanks, Alice. So, uh, Michael, you know, just talked about some of the most promising diagnostics that are becoming accessible to countries. Each of them have very distinct uh, attributes and, and, and value proposition. So deciding what solutions is best for any given country context, where it should be placed and how it should be utilized requires some thoughtful considerations that take into account country-specific programs and capabilities and testing needs on one end, as well as product characteristics and cost. Now, uh, different approaches can be taken to help inform product selection and placement decisions, all of which are meant to uh, make the diagnostics network more visible. 
uh, as a way to inform decision making. What approach is most appropriate for each country context might depend on the level of accessibility to data or the level of resources available, right? For example, the non-geospatial network assessment typically require less data and do not need any sort of modeling tools. These assessments would help us characterize the demand and capacity and identify, for example, instruments that are currently over or underutilized or providing insights over challenges that compromise the performance of the network, you know, thinking about the result and around time or the, the access level. These type of assessments can already be useful to inform uh, procurement and placement decisions. That said, uh, it's by adding the geospatial information that um, uh, more rational uh, decisions can be made. A geospatial assessment uh, incorporates the location information for both the testing sites and the referring sites, so that beyond knowing what devices are overutilized or underutilized, we can also visualize where the demand is originating from, indicating if and how the referral network could be adjusted, right, in, com in combination with new product placement decisions. A even more advanced uh, approach would be uh, making use of geospatial modeling, which requires you know, certain robust modeling tools to analyze the network and generate um, alternative improved scenarios that would inform more rational procurement placement decisions, as well as adjustments to the referral system. And so as we uh, go you know, from more you know, simpler to use non-geospatial assessments to geospatial assessments and the ones that are assisted by, by modeling solutions, then our accuracy and uh, it becomes greater in deciding what solutions should be placed where as a ways to make an impact. And that impact, again, can be measured in terms of you know, level of access, quality of testing and care, uh, or even efficiency. Now, if you move to the, to the next slide, the diagnostic network optimization that has been introduced by Michael Elon and, and probably might be familiar to, to most of you already is a type of geospatial modeling approach. This analytical approach allows countries to better align testing demands with testing capacity and ensure that the right products are placed in the right sites and ultimately, ultimately you know, result in um, you know, maximizing access to testing, improve the performance of the network and generate efficiencies. Now, there are multiple situations where a DNO could be beneficial. Whenever, for example, there are uh, changes in the testing demand in terms of new testing targets set by the national programs or a new type of test that need to be provided uh, to patients. In that case, the DNO could be used to identify what changes in the testing capacity and sample referral is needed in order to address that emerging need. There could be also situations that um, affect the capacity testing capacity instead of the testing demand. For example, new diagnoses become available, and that's you know very much aligned with the, the main subject of this discussion. Or uh, multiplexing capabilities become enabled at certain sites of instruments. Also, in these cases, the DNO could be used to inform placement decisions and adaptations to the to the referral network in order to better align the testing demand and the testing capacity. Beside these you know, changes on the demand side and testing on the testing capacity side, so there could be a number of other reasons why you know, could help inform um, programmatic decision-making. Whenever, for example, the performance of the diagnostics network is suboptimal or too costly. In all cases, the, the DNO would be used to make the uh, network more visible uh, and inform decisions around placement uh, of diagnostics and the associated referral system that needs to feed into the diagnostics capacity. Now, if you move to the to the next slide, please. Shai has um, worked over the past several years in a number of countries supporting 
governments uh, in uh, diagnostic network, network of, uh, uh, exercises. This slide particularly illustrates only a few uh, more recent examples of uh, where, where DNO was more specifically utilized to inform national procurement plans and other programmatic interventions. And the context was you know, the, helping countries to um, uh, plan for resource allocation and procurement decision making within the GC7 um, uh, funding envelope. In some instances, uh, DNO uh, informed device procurements, including in the global fund applications. In other instances, uh, DNO modeling informed placement of devices that they were already committed to. So depending on, on the specific needs, whether there is an opportunity to select uh, dark not, uh, select new solutions and, and make decisions on the procurement of uh, new solutions coming into the market, or even if a procurement decision has been made and the question is just where to place those, those instruments, the DNO can be used for this purpose. And in the, some of these countries listed here have applied to, to this context. Um, if you move to the, to the next slide, that said, um, you know, it's important to keep in mind that DNO uh, is a powerful tool, uh, but is, um, you know, is a data-driven approach that can really help, you know, inform decisions around procurement of devices and placement of new diagnostics. But there are certain limitations that come with it. So it cannot be the tool, you know, utilized um, uh, to inform decisions um, uh, alone, it has to be uh, complemented by a number of other considerations. The DNO, for example, you know, one of the conditions for uh, a network optimization exercise to take place uh, effectively is the participation of all the relevant stakeholders as part of the network optimization exercise, of course, under the leadership of the ministry. The DNO, rely on quality uh, data made available. Uh, and, and, and we know how difficult it is in some instances to collate and gather all the necessary information that can feed these optimization um, uh, considerations and, and decisions. Uh, also difficult to you know, ensure that the quality of the data is adequate and sufficient to then uh, you know, inform uh, decision making, and that data collection or data gathering uh, usually one of the most kind of resource intense phase of a network optimization approach. So, depending on the level of accessibility of the data and the quality of the data, then DNO you know, may be more or less useful to inform uh, the decision making process around placement of new diagnostics. Also, the, the scope of DNO exercises is somehow limited because it doesn't take into account a number of considerations and interventions that are relevant for decision making, uh, including, for example, uh, HR capacity um, or, or supply chain systems, uh, you know, capacity challenges and, and, and changes. And lastly, the kind of demand generation efforts that needs to accompany you know, the placement of new diagnostics is typically not part of the scope of a diagnostics network optimization exercises. So there are a number of interventions, interventions and decisions that needs to be made to lay out the ground and set up a platform for new diagnostics to then um, uh, be placed and the new op optimal scenarios of a diagnostics network to be realized, operationalized. So I would, um, just to summarize, if you just move to the next slide, the key kind of takeaways of, of this discussion, uh, there are many you know, diagnostic solutions that are approaching the market, some of which are extremely promising and really can make an impact, right, in improving access and uh, to quality testing and care. For these solutions to realize impact, they will have to be praised uh, rationally uh, into the diagnostics network as a way to serve the um, service delivery and reach the patients that are needs to access those tests. 
And so a data-driven approach in, in this context is needed uh, you know, to inform what diagnostics should be placed where. Um, and the DNO exercise is an approach, a data-driven approach that can be utilized exactly for, for this purpose, to make the network optimization more visible to the de decision makers and highlight and identify opportunities where those specific diagnostics would be most impactful and are aligned with the capabilities of the hosting hosting size. I will stop here and and um, uh, back to you, Alice. Thank you, thank you so much, Paolo. And um, uh, uh, you know, uh, you you present very very good uh, uh, insights on um, the diagnostics net network uh, optimization. I I I I have so much to say to what Paolo, both Paolo and Michael have said. But I noticed that we have only 25 minutes left to the end of this webinar, so I will not uh, spend any more time, but rather call on um, my colleague, my friend, uh, Talemwa Nalugwa, who is uh, the program manager for the Uganda Tuberculosis uh, Implementation Research Consortium, Walimu, and she will be presenting to us about results from a large-scale decentralized clinical trial. Talemwa, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Alice, for the introduction. And like you have rightly said, my name is Tarima Nabugwa. And today I will be speaking about uh, the Expel TV trial that we implemented in Uganda. Slide, please. So the Expel TV uh, trial was a multi component uh, strategy or intervention whose goal was really to try and see how the gap in TB case detection that has remained critical challenge can be addressed using not only one uh, component or introducing a device, but combining multiple interventions to try and address the gap. As you can see in the current slide that we have right now, the prevalence is uh, still high, but as we go along the con continuum of care, uh, many of the TB patients or many of the presumed TB patients actually seek care at health facility level. Uh, we can see 72% manage to reach the diagnostic center, but as you go along the continuum of care, uh, the diagnosis, diagnosis level uh, starts to drop and eventually for those that make it to get treatment, it actually drops uh, further. So there's still a big challenge there. And like the previous speakers have also highlighted uh, many of the diagnostic interventions that we are trying to evaluate are trying to address this challenge. Next slide, please. So as part of the Expel TB uh, strategy, the aim of uh, this evaluation was to try and see how experts can perform and how uh, the patients can be linked to care after a diagnosis. The aim of the Expel TB was to quantify the gap in TB diagnosis at health facility level and how the patients can be linked to, uh, to, to care after getting their results. The second aim was to identify modifiable barriers to high quality TB diagnostic services. And this was done at provider level, at patient level and health system level. This was done uh, both uh, through interaction with the healthcare workers to try and understand what can be modified to improve uh, TB diagnostic care. And then lastly, uh, the aim was to develop and evaluate a theory driven intervention to improve the quality of TB diagnostics care. Next slide, please. So like I mentioned before, uh, the Expel TB intervention was a multi-faceted uh, uh, intervention. We introduced uh, our a one module gene expert device at a uh, health facility level. And this was at uh, health facility three and health facility four level. 
and this was uh, meant to reduce the workload, increase the speed and accuracy of testing. All the, all the expert devices were deployed at the health facilities. The second uh, strategy of the intervention was to, with the healthcare providers, uh, discuss and see what structures or what uh, patient flow can be redesigned to facilitate same-day testing. As you may all be aware, most of the testing and the diagnostics care that is done at health facility level takes multiple days to have a diagnosis done and eventually get tested and initiated on treatment. So as part of this strategy, we wanted to understand how can we address the lack of urgency the failure of these patients to return to the facilities to uh, receive their results and get initiated in care. The third strategy of the intervention was to provide regular feedback to the healthcare providers, uh, looking at uh, metrics of the quality of care, documentation in the registers that are provided at the facility. And this was done by looking at the uh, data that was being captured in these registers on a daily basis, we had um, uh, systems where we could uh, look at this data on a daily basis and to improve the communication with the, the care providers. Of this is what we see. How can we improve? How can we work with you to improve uh, documentation, uh, capture of the quality metrics, and coordination in general? Next slide, please. So the, the, the trial design, as you can see, we implemented a clustered randomized uh, trial where we implemented this at 20 health facilities. Uh, 10 facilities were randomized to the standard of care where these facilities continued to implement what they would have ideally implemented on a regular day. And then 10 health facilities were randomized to the expel TB strategy that we just explained in the previous slide. Uh, the study was implemented among adult uh, presumed TB patients that presented at health facilities between October 20, 2018 and March 2022. We did not include uh, patients who were RIF are resistant in this uh, trial or even during the analysis. And all this work has been published in the New England uh, Journal. Next slide, please. So uh, during the randomization uh, process, we actually invited all the 20 health facilities that participated in the study uh, in a public randomization ceremony. The reason we did this is to uh, create and encourage transparency. Uh, the health facility staff, we had uh, representatives from Ministry of Health at the National TB and Leprosy Program. We had the district health officers and all of them were part of this public randomization to create uh, transparency, but also as a, a participatory approach. So all of them witnessed and participated in the process of this randomization and they all knew which um, facilities were randomized to the intervention group and which facilities were randomized to the control or the standard of care group to avoid any biases or any um, lack of transparency. We, were, we are also happy to uh, present to you that as part of uh, this trial, we managed to get a waiver of informed consent from the institution review boards that were primarily responsible for monitoring the uh, ethical implementation of the trial. And also we did not uh, uh, participate in, patients did not take on any chest x-rays. We did not conduct any culture or any uh, additional patient uh, contacts. Uh, some of the data sources that we regularly abstracted from the routine registers, we use the TB registers, the presumed TB registers, and the lab registers to abstract uh, patient level data on a monthly basis. To encourage regular flow of information and communication, like I mentioned earlier, we would uh, contact the healthcare providers on a biweekly basis just to check in on the quality of data and to ensure that the registers were being uh, completed. 
as part of uh, uh, the baseline process, we also conducted a refresher training at all the 20 health facilities to ensure that uh, all the facilities are aware and updated about the standard guidelines in TB care, but also uh, to ensure communication. We uh, conducted quarterly site visits to the different health facilities to ensure data completeness, resolve any queries that were observed in the data, but also generally we conducted some studies uh, that included some qualitative interviews and also a uh, time and motion uh, surveys to uh, look at the cost effectiveness of the trial. Next slide, please. So the primary outcome of the trial, we were looking at the number of patients who are treated with a confirmed TB test within 14 days. And like we mentioned earlier, we were looking at other secondary outcomes along the continuum of care, where we looked at the number of uh, patients that completed TB testing as per the national guidelines. Uh, we also, at diagnostic level, we also looked at the number of patients who are diagnosed with a confirmed TB test. We looked at the number of patients who were treated with confirmed TB and the number of patients who were treated with uh, TB in, in general. And uh, so we, are, we are calling same day testing as uh, a test that was evaluated, a diagnosis was got on the same day when the sample was collected. That was the definition of same day testing. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Thank you. So in terms of um, In terms of the primary outcome, the, date, uh, the, the analysis was uh, at cluster level and the uh, different clusters were the different health facilities that participated in the study. If you look at the data that was, uh, we had about 342 uh, patients in the intervention group and about 220 in the control group. And all this data was uh, adjusted for the randomization strata, number of patients who are treated for confirmed TB within 40 days. And the trial period was uh, 12 months. Next slide. So we had other subgroups analysis that were conducted during this period. And for... Um, in the intervention group, we had about 234 male who participated as compared to the control group where we had 147 male. Uh, in the subgroup of HIV infection, we had 134 in the intervention group and 75 in the control group that had, uh, H that had HIV infection. All these uh, subgroup analyses were adjusted still for randomization straight uh, number of patients treated for confirmed TB within 14 days. Next slide, please. And among the secondary outcomes, as you, you can see, we I'll just emphasize that we had a high, fidelity in the implementation of this uh, trial, and it also improved the quality of care across the cascade of care, ranging from uh, testing, diagnosis, uh, time to treatment, and also the treatment outcomes for the patients that were initiated on treatment. Next slide, please. Uh, the trial was definitely, uh, with, I can highlight some of the key limitations from the trial. There was a potential imbalance in the underlying prevalence of TB and other factors by trial arm, uh, given the relatively smaller number of clusters. 
the multifaceted intervention, of course, uh, there are effects of decentralized molecular testing alone, looking at it alone uh, was not uh, something that you could make a conclusion upon. And in terms of generalizability, uptake and impact of the intervention strategy in other burden, in other high burden countries is uncertain since uh, similar evaluations need to be done in other high burden uh, countries. Slide. So uh, in conclusion, um, we reported that scaling up of novel diagnostic tests alone is unlikely to significantly increase uh, case detection. Uh, and similar to what other presenters have said, I think in the diagnostic landscape, it will be important for uh, for people to have actually choice to be able to decide that if you combine this and this and this, this could be the potential outcome that you could get. For the expert TB strategy uh, alone, we combined on-site expert testing with a lot of implementation support. And from that multifaceted intervention, we were able to see an increase uh, in TB diagnos diagnosis and treatment by about 56%. We're also able to recognize an improved quality metrics at each step along the continuum of care during the time that we evaluated the expert TB intervention. As a recommendation to the national TB programs, there is need to consider decentralization of molecular uh, testing, especially closer to the communities or to the users and most of all to have a people-centered design approach where you try to understand the needs of the people that you're planning with to be able to bridge the detection gap and improve the quality of care. And lastly, we also observe that implementation science-based methodologies are useful in designing and implementing health system uh, interventions to address the health system challenges, but also generally to bridge uh, the gap in the TB case uh, detection uh, challenges or gaps that were observed. Yes. Next slide, please. I'd like to thank the team that participated in the Expel TB uh, intervention and evaluation, and also like to thank our collaborators that we work with at Walimu and at the Uganda Tuberculosis Implementation Research Consortium. Thank you so much, and back to you, Alice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Talemwa, for sharing with us those uh, key findings, recommendations, and the conclusions of uh, the Expel TB study. Um, colleagues, I see that we are only eight, uh, eight minutes. I almost said eight hours. Hmm. But yes, we are only eight minutes to the end of uh, this webinar, and I kindly request that if we can hang on for just five more minutes, I promise you we will be done at uh, five, uh, uh, yes, at 35 past, so that we can be able to respond to some of the questions that you have, and um, any other questions will come, uh, will be responded to either on email or during our next uh, study club. I know that I said this the last time um, and I am not fulfilling my promise, but I want you to count on me this time and please hold me for my word this time. All right, then um, I will uh, open up uh, for questions. I know that some questions have already been responded to in the chat and anyone else who really um has a question and you are able to put it in the chat, please proceed. Otherwise, uh, I would want to open up for the very, very burning questions that we have uh, so that we can respond to those in the next maybe uh, seven, seven to 10 minutes. All right, what does the silence mean? <clears throat> <clears throat> Okay, I have one question, and uh, this is about, uh, it's a question on pathways of the new tests, the lengthy, 
the lengthy of test introduction is hampered by many barriers, but one is at regulatory bodies level. What can be done now to expedite the process? The length of tests of tests introduction is hampered by many barriers. So what can be done to expedite this process? Um, I'll, I'll hand over, uh, uh, Michael, Paolo, are you able to respond to that? Uh, Paolo, do you want to take a first cut or Alice, can you just repeat key points just so I can make sure I'm being clear? I'm trying to, I'm trying to look at chat as well, but. Yeah. So the question is about uh, pathways to, uh, pathways of the new tests and, uh, the length of test introduction is hampered by many barriers. One of them being regulatory at one of them being at regulatory uh, bodies level. So, what can be done to expedite this process? Okay, um, I'll put my camera on just so I can answer that. Um, regulation of diagnostics is done at several levels. It can be done at country level. It can be done through EMEA. It can be done through FDA approvals. The WHO has a PQ process increasingly that it's looking to apply to TB diagnostics, that's a relatively new process. Um, I do share the notion that um, countries can only access uh, diagnostics that have regulatory approval. And in many countries that remains a huge barrier to adoption. I suspect that um, some of these global efforts in terms of getting the data set to be able to get the WHO to approve it is a kind of critical point before then regulators um, can say this is not just a, a, an approach, but a specific diagnostic platform that we can now approve. Um, Paolo, I know that we are doing work with a number of regulatory authorities to, to try to expedite that process to go from once you have the guideline approval um, to, to, to sort of expedite that. Maybe you could take over there. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Yes, uh, I would add that um, Besides the kind of global regulatory processes that you know, Michael, you mentioned, you know, one of the challenges that the kind of national um, process to approve and to register products in country and approve it for use, and there are ongoing efforts that have been uh, ongoing efforts now in the last few years to harmonize these uh, uh, regulatory processes by the uh, national, national regulatory process by creating um, some regional um, coordinating mechanisms that allow countries to kind of avoid duplicating, um, you know, lengthy dupli um, uh, the validations exercises that often cause, you know, delay in product registration and adoption. Um, Africa CDC has been um, you know, a leading partner in this space, uh, working alongside um, other agencies to try harmonize the regulatory approval processes across uh, countries, you know, in Africa. Um, but I think that's one avenue that has been already um, um, taken to to make to streamline this process. Um, in addition to obviously working with the global agencies to. Um, expedite that process and bring in the kind of evidence and guide also manufacturers in in submitting dossiers that are more complete, um, which required um, uh, that kind of more ready for uh, the products to be to be uh, assessed and, and registered. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I do have a couple other questions, but I want to give Abu Bakr a chance uh, to unmute and ask his question live. Ok, merci beaucoup. Moi, je suis Abokar Siri Kourouma. Je suis directeur exécutif de l'ONG Santé Espoir Vie en Guinée, en République de Guinée, Conakry. Et je vous remercie. Je remercie beaucoup les panélistes, les présentateurs par rapport aux différentes informations et notions qu'ils viennent de nous partager. Et concernant l'introduction de ces différents types que vous venez de présenter. Est-ce que c'est circonscrit à une zone bien déterminée pour le moment ou bien c'est 
tous les pays doivent s'engager dans la même directive selon les, les instructions ou les orientations de l'OMS. Parce que nous, on a des difficultés jusqu'à présent à diversifier les interventions pour un meilleur accès au traitement au niveau communautaire en matière de, 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 de TV. Donc, est-ce que les, les, les informations que vous venez de partager sont destinées à tous les pays? Merci. Paolo, do you want to take that? Uh, sorry, I activated the translations too too late, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, anybody that can summarize in English? Paolo, I think... Oh, OK. Il n'y a pas de problème. Merci beaucoup. Je dis que par rapport à, à aux nouvelles directives et aux toutes les informations que vous venez de partager. Et dans vos interventions, j'ai entendu que selon les directives de l'OMS, et si c'est comme ça, c'est tous les pays qui sont concernés. Mais souvent, dans l'introduction de certaines molécules ou bien de certaines initiatives, on circonscrit à un certain nombre de pays avant de les passer à l'échelle. Est-ce que pour le moment, dans ce cas de figure, c'est tous les pays qui sont concernés, ou bien c'est uniquement un certain nombre de pays qui vont servir de pays pilotes avant de passer à l'échelle. Hein? Parce que dans notre cas en Guinée, nous avons des difficultés à diversifier le, les canaux de dispensation des médicaments ou des prises en charge. Jusqu'à présent, c'est la, la position. Euh, nous nous focalisons sur la verticalité. Uniquement, les soins sont offerts au niveau des formations sanitaires. Les, les approches communautaires sont très, très limitées dans, en Guinée. Donc, ce sont mes deux petites questions que je voudrais poser. Merci. Did you get it, Paolo? I think if I understood correctly, the question is whether the WHO recommendations can apply, it can be utilized to form diagnostic placements and how they integrate into the service delivery. Uh, uh, Michael, did you capture the question more clearly? I guess at some level, the question is, how do countries get access to some of these technologies? How do they think about how they can use it before the WHO says you can do it? Uh, which I think is important. And I think there is a process of doing some technical validation, but there's also an urgent need to do a use case assessment in countries. How are we going to take this platform? How are we going to use it? Okay, the WHO says it can be used. That's somewhat a starting point for figuring out how we're going to deploy it in country and then how we can get the benefits. So there is a an interesting option to say, can I do that in parallel? Do I wait until the WHO says it's exciting? Or if there are things that we think could be really helpful for our country, how do we either get involved in the research um, networks? How do we um, get partners or people to do pilots in our country to help us explore some of these solutions? And I think that that's I think that's a question for all of the, the, the stakeholders on this call is the WHO guideline advice is a starting point. It simply says you can use a tool. It doesn't tell you how, where, what to do, how to capture the value in your country. And by the time you do that, years may have passed from the guidelines until you're really ready to scale up. And if we're going to scale up, as Alice said, we're going to do it faster, then countries need to know what and how they're going to use things faster. Um, I would advise that stakeholders on this call look to the global fund, the various donors to say, okay, we've got all these tools. 
tell me what's the plan for figuring out what we're going to use, how we're going to use it in our country, and what the benefits will be to stakeholders. So often the NTPs are busy trying to just do their daily job of keeping patients alive. Um, but we have to, as Alice said at the beginning, push them to do more. How do we not just keep patients alive, but are building a plan for how to do that in a better way, even before sometimes there are guidelines in place. Some of that's participating in studies, some of that's operational research, and how do we find the budget and the will at country to make that possible? And I would encourage that that's what the stakeholders on this call can do. We can be pushing our countries um, and pushing the donors in our countries to be supporting this even before the guidelines come out to accelerate the, the time to uptake. Because otherwise, as you say, there is a very long lead time between innovation and when that benefits a patient. Over. Great, thank you so much. And I'm looking at time, so I'll just uh, uh, request uh, each one of my panelists to, I'll, I'll pose one question for you. And as you respond, you give your uh, closing remark. Uh, and uh, again, just to remind all uh, uh, participants on this um, webinar, we do have a third session that will be held on October 30th, and that will be at the same time, which is 2 p.m. Central European time. Uh, but my last, my question uh, is, uh, uh, so I have one question coming in on, um, uh, could you talk about diagnostics in the private sector and how prices can be lowered in case patients can't go to public facilities? I, Who wants I, I sent an email in response to that or a chat message in response to that, but um, Chai worked in India on a program called IPAC, which is a, an abbreviation for uh, a program effectively that gave the private sector public sector pricing in exchange for a commitment that they would use quality assured um, diagnostics, basically in line with national guidelines instead of other things that were perhaps not quality assured, and that they would um, set pricing at access levels. Um, it was it was very successful. Obviously, uh, India has a huge private sector, and it allowed them to expand the capacity for patients and expand patient choice. Um, that's a it, it's a it's an approach, not necessarily just a project. It's gone on years after after the Chai project ended. It's still going on some like nine years later. Um, and my advice would be: I know that the Gates Foundation and a number of donors are very interested. Um, there's a lot of documentation about how it was implemented, and um, there there are resources that I can, uh, if people are interested, uh, Alice, if you and your colleagues can maybe collect, here are people that are interested, I can try to help you with um, materials that you can add to the repository um, for this uh, platform. Excellent. Thank you so much, Michael. And uh, uh, Paolo or uh, Talemoa, we have a question coming in. Uh, please bear with me, it's quite long. It's um, as countries focus on community-based TB testing to kind of make point of care more practical, there is need to establish an effective system for data capture and reporting. The device-less tools such as TB rapid diagnostics of testing kits might uh, are likely to complicate data capture for accountability purposes. The HIV program struggles with this. How do we intend to approach this situation? I think Is that are, uh, sorry. Proceed, proceed, Paolo. Yeah, there are a number of um, connectivity solutions that enable uh, the kind of traceability and collection of data um, for device-free diagnostics that have been utilized um, in parts during the COVID-19 pandemic with the antigenesis in part. Um, there is some experience uh, from the in the HIV space with uh, HIV self-test um, and rapid test that can be there. But it, it remains a, a, an important question, you know, how much... Obviously, the more we decentralize testing and um, uh, we go, we reach the communities, the more difficult it is to um, maintain the link between the diagnostics and kind of a central repository of, of data that inform programmatic decision making. Um, so although challenging, I think there are solutions 
that would enable that connectivity that should be explored and, and drawing from programs that have test them out, I think it might be a good um, um, you know, next step um, as, a, as a way to learn from, from past experiences. There we can also, again, as a follow-up to this discussion, uh, make available some material and experiences that can help inform uh, this question even better. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Paolo. And lastly, to Talemoa, the question that I have for you is that for the recommendations that you make, what um, what strategies are you uh, uh, implementing to, to ensure that these recommendations are actually taken on board? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Alice. I think for uh, as a continuation of the Expo TB work that we have done in the past, one of the things that we have done very uh, deliberately in Uganda is to actually engage the National TB and the Proceed Program as uh, one of the key stakeholders in the TB uh, landscape or in the TB work that we are doing. And to also, uh, at that level, to understand from them how can we work with them as uh, researchers to see that whatever we are doing or whatever we are planning fits within the national strategic plans. Many times, I think as researchers, we do a very good high quality work, but I think translating that into uh, or scaling it up to have it uh, adopted and sustained, I think has been a bit of a challenge. So as a follow on uh, of the Expel TB work, we have worked very closely with our program to see that uh, when we're doing this work, we are, when we're planning it, even at ideation level, that we engage them to ensure that uh, there's continuity of some of this good research work and that it can be translated and scaled even after the project has ended. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And a huge thanks to my panelists today. Uh, to all the participants, please be informed that um, the slides and a recording will be shared with you um, in the coming few days, maybe um, three to four days, you'll get uh, slides and uh, the recording of this webinar. And just as a reminder, this, this is part three, part two of the three uh, series. The last will be held on 30th of October at uh, 2 p.m. Central European time. And we look forward to seeing you. Like I said, on uh, September 17th, we will, oops, sorry about that. Like I said, on September 17th, we will put a comma again this time to be continued uh, on October 30th. But in the meantime, everything, all the slides and uh, recording will be shared with you. And in case anyone has a question, please feel free to forward it to us. We will be happy to respond to your questions online. Otherwise, thank you for thank you so much and looking forward to seeing you all on 30th of October.